May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, recordings don't lie, so it seems that last week's sermon about St. Francis and St. Martin was 20 minutes long. (laughs) And then I had the nerve to say it was only part one. (laughs) So I'm grateful and a little surprised that any of you came back this week. That's what comes from preaching from notes. So no worries, it's all written out today. And I'm going to keep it simple. As simple as Jesus kept it with the rich young man in today's gospel. Sell what you have. Give to the poor and come follow me. 300 years later, give or take, St. Martin took that to heart. And 800 years after that, so did St. Francis. And almost 800 years after Francis, so did the founders of St. Martin's. As I said last week, they valued simplicity, diversity, solidarity with the poor and marginalized, and sacrificial giving. That's in our parish DNA. Now, especially as we ask you to start thinking about how you'll support St. Martin's mission next year, that phrase, sacrificial giving, may be a little loaded, even sound a little self-serving. Luckily, we've got Amos and Jesus to do the heavy lifting. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate, Amos says, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. And Jesus is even more blunt. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus' metaphor is supposed to astonish us, as it did the disciples, make us uncomfortable, make us squirm. It's a great example of what the author of Hebrews says about the word of God being sharper than any two-edged sword, judging the intentions of the heart, laying us bare. But Jesus isn't saying rich people don't go to heaven. Well, at least he's not saying that here. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke is pretty challenging on that score, at least for rich people oblivious and unresponsive to the suffering of those around them. But the kingdom of God isn't the afterlife. It's a way of being on earth. At the beginning of Mark, the first part of Jesus' message is, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. I love the string of synonyms that our presiding bishop used in the homily I quoted from two weeks ago, a human tapestry, God's wondrous variety, the kingdom, the reign of God, the beloved community. And why is it hard for a rich person to get into that party? Not because we're not invited, but wealth can isolate and insulate us from life, from many of its struggles, yes, but also from its deepest joys. It can fool us into forgetting how much we need God and how much we need each other. Frederick Buechner says, maybe the reason is not that the rich are so wicked they're kept out of the place, but that they're so out of touch with reality they can't see it's a place worth getting into. Then who can be saved? Here's where the second part of Jesus' message comes in. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, turn around. Remember and believe the good news that we're all God's children. The needy in the gate are our sisters and brothers and siblings. Everything we have comes from God. And the point of life 
is to love God and love each other. The more we give away, the more we have. When we truly believe that, sacrificial giving comes naturally. Which is not to say that it comes easily. But there are a couple of details in Mark's version of the story that point to two truths that help us on that journey. I'll start with the second one. The last will be first. When Peter says, look, we have left everything and followed you, Jesus reassures him that everyone who has given up home or family or fields for his sake and for the sake of the good news will receive a hundredfold back. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions. Wait, what was that last one? Only Mark has that word. Sneaks in that little bit of uncomfortable truth-telling <clears throat> that following Jesus doesn't prevent challenges. On the contrary, it invites resistance, discomfort, disappointment, loss. I have one more sabbatical story to illustrate this point. It's not the last one, chances are, but the last of this stretch. And it's not a persecution by any means, but it did hit home. Way back in February, as part of our sabbatical planning process, I wanted to make something to symbolize the journey. So Lisa Bell and I went to paint on pottery, and I painted this beautiful heart-shaped bowl to say, what makes your heart sing? Which was the question the Lily Grant folks had invited us to ponder. It was red with layers, of course, of musical notes. And on the edge, I wrote Aginato, which is shorthand for a motto that my friend Jim and I have had for 40 years. The bowl kept me company all those months. It was a place to put prayer intentions and a feather and shells. So on June 1st, after carefully wrapping it up, I got distracted grabbed what I thought was just an unfolded towel and dropped it on the floor where it promptly shattered. But the piece where I had written Aginato was spared. A joyous expectation, not a demanding one, it stands for. Truth number one, brokenness happens. The other detail comes earlier in the gospel story, after the young man tells Jesus he has kept all the commandments since his youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. This story appears in Matthew and Luke, too, but only Mark says this, Jesus loved him. Warren tells me that his former bishop used to say, when Jesus loves you, look out. And that seems like good advice. But as we heard in Hebrews, Jesus also sympathizes with our weaknesses. He was tested as we are, and he gives us mercy and grace to help in our time of need. So when we look back at painful history in our own lives, in the lives of our ancestors, as we did at our forum hour today, Jesus is with us. Truth number two, rich or poor, black or white or indigenous, Republican or Democrat, we are loved. I've already quoted Frederick Beekner twice in two weeks, and I've probably shared this one before, but it captures these two truths better than anything else I know. He writes, the grace of God means something like, here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. So for almost eight months now, 
We've been on a pilgrimage to gather wisdom from all the layers of our past. Martin's life, our parish history, the vision of our founders, stories of our members and friends, and this fall to bring it forward into our future. That's that Sankofa bird image, right? Reaching back to the past to bring it forward. So on Friday, I visited Steve Prince's Sankofa Seed sculpture, which is in the Legacy Tribute Garden near Jefferson Hall at William and Mary. And its pedestal contains the last names of the college's first African-American students, including two very familiar ones to us, Blayton and Engs. And yesterday, Warren and I went to see History Half Told is Untold, the documentary about First Baptist Church. Before the film, Connie Hartshaw, the president of the Let Freedom Ring Foundation, thanked the white descendants of the Cole family who gave the land for the church more than 200 years ago, saying, we are one America. Talk about grace proceeding and following us. The party is happening all around us. Reckoning and truth-telling and healing and hope in Williamsburg, in the Episcopal Church, in the United States. Maybe not in the headlines or your Facebook feed, but it's happening. And St. Martin's was an early adopter in 1963. And we've kept the flame alive ever since, sometimes flickering, sometimes burning brighter. I'd love to see how we'd shine if everybody joined in. May God's graciousness be upon us, prosper the work of our hands, prosper our handiwork. Amen. Stand.